Eric Mann, uh, who uh, I've known of and have known for many years. Uh, one of, uh, from my perspective, one of the most important activists here in the uh, city of Los Angeles. Uh, extremely well known regarding transportation issues and the Bus Riders Union, but also impacting all kinds of, uh, of other issues. And uh, he uh, uh, also has a radio show on, is it Mondays? Mondays um, at 4 on KPFK. K KPFK, my favorite station. Uh, on Mondays at 4, uh, call numbers are 90.7 90 90 FM. 90.7 FM, okay? My favorite station. Uh, the reason I don't 90, it's just on my, it's on my uh, uh, reset. Yeah, thank you. It's on my preset. That's why I don't have to ever look for it. Okay, 90.7 KPFK, all right? I've been on this show several times. Yep. And uh, uh, also one of my good friends who's, who's been here before, Antonio Gonzalez, also has a show on that station, all right? And then we also have with us Dr. Alvo, whose area of expertise and interest are in the exposure assessment and acute and chronic respiratory effects of airborne pollutants, air quality, okay? And so these two uh, individuals are quite uh, knowledgeable about the issues uh, impacting uh, us on a, on a daily life uh, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, we're going to start with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mann, and then we'll go to uh, Dr. Oval. Okay, Eric. Well, hi, everybody. Um, my objectives, thank you, Dr. Guetta, for inviting us, and, and our objectives for coming here today, I mean, why do we do this, is to find, you know, the few who are awake out there, uh, to find the few students who want to actually change society and join a social revolution, because when I was in college, I was recruited by the black movement at Cornell University in 1964, who asked me if I wanted to join the Civil Rights Revolution. I joined it and I haven't stopped since. I'm with the Bus Riders Union, I'm with the Labor Community Strategy Center. We're here to talk about environmental justice. And again, at the end, I'm gonna to try to leave five minutes to talk about a lot of things that you can do and that we urgently need you to do in the next month or so, the real things in the real world. Um, in, environmentalism began in the United States fundamentally as a conservative movement, as a white people's movement. I consider it a pro-imperialist movement. If you notice, it's, uh, its original name was called conservation. So what they sort of said is after we go into the Indians' indigenous land and kill everybody, let's make sure we have a park, you know? And after we, <laughs> and after we bring the slaves over and ruin their lives and their families, let's make sure that we keep a mountain. And so that was sort of the idea of, you know, travel for the white imperialists to make sure you don't simply dig up everything. But if you notice, Bush is pushing right now to even protect those little um, uh, enclaves. So conservation was originally, as I say, a conservative, even its root word is conserve, to conserve what's left of what? Of, of capitalism out of control. Um, then came the Civil Rights Movement, fast forwarding 300 years, and the Civil Rights Movement, when it began, was not focusing primarily on ecological questions, it was focusing on police brutality, on racial discrimination, on not going to fight in the war in Vietnam, on issues like that. But interestingly, that great Civil Rights Movement of the 60s and 70s had such a radical vision. When you, if you look at the last speeches of Martin Luther King, when he began to put together the equation of Vietnam, speaking about low wage workers in, in Tennessee where he was killed, talking about a poor people's march. It's interesting that the first Earth Day in 1970 uh, was part of the 60s. It was part of the uh, women's movement, the early gay and lesbian movements, that is to say that the black movement, in my opinion, played a profound effect on the Chicano movement, a profound effect on the, uh, if you ask the people in AIM, uh, the American Indian movement, they got a lot from the Panthers and so forth. So the black movement to me was the um, prime mover of all the other movements and progressive movements in society. And back then, we talked about having, being part of the movement, you were part of the movement. Um, Things got conservative, and in several books I'm writing, I'm discussing the counter-revolution that took place in around 1975 uh, after the United States was defeated in Vietnam and the rise of Reagan in 1980. 
Sometime in the 1980s and 1990s, the movement declined. The movement I'm talking about primarily in black, Latino, and Asian Pacific Islander communities. It turned in on itself. It became very 501c3. Some of it became explicitly poverty pimp. Some of it became good. Some of it was just social services. But people had given up on the revolution and tried to just do something good in the community. But out of something good that started happening in the community, there was a growing interest in public health. And uh, Dr. Eiffel is going to speak afterwards about a lot of those issues. But there began to be a growing awareness of the toxic contaminants in communities of color over issues such as in this white, predominantly white community in um, Love Canal in Buffalo, New York. I don't know what year that was. Um, when they found, you know, all these people had built this little suburban track on toxic, <coughs> polluted land. It's a, there was a similar struggle that happened out in Riverside, um, Penny Newman's work. There was a struggle in um, South Central, concerned citizens of South Central, uh, over the issue of toxic incinerations. So what started to be, you could say, um, a more insular movement, where people started thinking about just their communities, what they found in their communities was that the society still used black, Latino, Asian, and indigenous communities to dump the byproducts of toxic chemicals out of control. And that whether it's mining or the chemical industry or the oil industry, many of the worst ecological impacts and dumping was going on in those communities. Out of that, in 1991, came the first People of Color Summit on Environmental Justice. And, and we were very proud. Of, I'm with a group called the Labor <coughs> Community Strategy Center, which spun off the Bus Riders Union. And we had, had already begun organizing down in Wilmington. Because down in Wilmington, California, if you ever go down there, anybody from there? Anybody seen it? If you go down there, it's like refinery row. You go down there, you can't breathe. If back then there was Arco, Chevron, Texaco, Unical, Ultramar, and who was living across from it? Low-income Latino, primarily immigrants, who had taken these apartments precisely because it was so cheap to live across from a refinery. And we organized a movement there against Texaco when the Texaco refinery exploded, just like the British Petroleum um, refinery just exploded, I believe, in Texas just the other day. We moved from there to the Bus Riders Union because we started discussing environmental racism around the issue that low-income people could not get to work, could not get to school on the buses because almost all the money was going to suburban rail lines, to, that is to say, the red line, the blue line, the green line, trying to take a more affluent passenger um, from perhaps the uh, defense industry to Norwalk. You know, so one of them would go from El Segundo to Norwalk, and I don't know anybody who ever wanted to go from El Segundo to Norwalk, you know. But I know a lot of people want to go from South LA to get a job in the San Fernando Valley. You can't get one unless you have a car. I know a lot of students in the Valley who would like to even come to school here and can't if they have a bus coming down because there is no bus service on the 405 anymore. So the Bus Riders Union sued Los Angeles MTA, say that it set up a separate and unequal mass transit system in which most of the resources were given to the rail system. That is to say, if there's a rail line that leaves from Union Station, goes out to Santa Clarita, and the, the subsidy on that is $15 per passenger. But on an inner city bus that's packed wall to wall with low income people, the subsidy is only 33 cents. So what that means is that you're paying virtually the whole ride if you're poor. But if you're middle class, they want you to go out to the suburbs and not use your car. So they give you this enormous subsidy, which is unfair. So we sued the MTA under Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act under separate and unequal, saying they were setting up a racist 
bus system. And to our surprise, we won. And they settled with us in what's called a consent decree. A consent decree is a legally negotiated deal between two parties, usually one party who's guilty and doesn't want to go to court, and the other party is the civil rights group or the environmental group, and the, and the so-called um, defendant, in this case the MTA, agreed to buy a lot of buses, agreed to keep the fare down to $42. Um, a month. A month, thank you. And um, basically agreed to make the bus system the priority. They have not made the bus system a priority. And one of my criticisms of a very progressive candidate, Antonio Vitagosa, which we want to go talk to him about, is he's talking a lot now about extending the green line to the airport. He's talking about extending all these rail lines. But he's not talking about protecting $1 billion for the bus system, which is still what 90% of the people use in L.A., which is the bus system. Now, so you mean 90% of those who ride mass transit use bus yes. as opposed to uh, rail? That's correct, 90%. Now, if I had more time, I would tell you a lot of things that we've done, but I'm going to conclude uh, with moving almost right away to what you can do, because I think that's the most of some issues that are out there. The first thing that really is amazing, we just had a big victory yesterday. How many people here take the bus to school here? It's okay. just, you can't get here on the bus. That's the problem. Well, you can't get here on the bus, but also it's a little more of an affluent student body. I mean, if, if, if you didn't have a car. Or also a highly residential uh, campus. Right. Okay. So for all those reasons. But we have just won a student bus pass for the first time, high school students and public students, uh, public school students, uh, can now go and get their bus pass without this lengthy application process, which is very important. Now, I want to focus on a couple of issues that are out there. I think you know that the right wing is moving in a legislative direction, in, a, in an almost brilliant way, to take away people's civil rights and their opportunities to even win civil rights. So they, two years ago, the Supreme Court passed something called the um, Sandoval Bill. The Sandoval Bill said that low income, that you could not bring a case against the federal government based on what's called disparate impacts of race unless it was brought by the Attorney General. And the Attorney General at the time was John Ashcroft. So you can imagine he's not going to bring any cases. And what is the name of the Attorney General today? I'm sorry. Al Gonzalez. Al Gonzalez, who's a right wing who, who's also not going to bring any civil rights cases against the government. So we have won what's called a consent decree, which is a signed contract with the MTA. So there's a now a bill coming before Congress called the Alexander Bill. And this bill says that after four years, if you sign, like we have a 10-year consent decree with the MTA to fix up the buses, after four years, that, that decree will be declared null and void if the government doesn't like what it signs. So imagine if you signed a 10-year lease, you know, you could get out of it. If you signed a 10-year car payment, you could get out of it if you didn't like it. No, that's not how it works. But it says if government signs a 10-year agreement, they can try to get out of it after four years, which is very, very dangerous because it, it means that, first, it's going to be very hard to take them to court, and then secondly, it's taken us about eight years to get the MTA to get 2,300 buses. I don't know if you know that. We now have the best bus system in the United States, 2,300 clean fuel buses that the Bus Riders Union has won. So we have to try to defeat this bill. And talking to you about how to defeat a bill and how to call people on the Senate Judiciary Committee, how to write letters, how to get on the phone, how to actually help us Mark Anthony Johnson is here from the Bus Riders Union. And for those who would like to know, and we, we're asking you to come on over and join us after the talk. The second is to, is to buy books from the Strategy Center. There are very few movement books out there. And we have two books here at least. One is called Ellie's Lethal Air, which we have a special price of $10. And the other is called Dispatches from Durban about the World Conference Against Racism. And we hope you would consider getting a copy of that. I wrote that. Uh, it's been out about a couple of years. 
The next thing is our annual political party is coming up Saturday, May 7th at the Radisson Wilshire Hotel. It, tickets are $50 for students and $100 for more affluent people or more affluent students. Um, and it's a great party. It's both very political and it's, and it's got a, it's going to have a doo-wop oldies group and then it's going to have a terrific DJ that's going to, we're going to dance for a couple of hours. But you'll be exposed to a very multiracial, multi-class, radical group of people in the United States where you almost wouldn't believe it's happening. That's Saturday night, May 7th. Then finally, we're looking for a few people who would like to join our National School for Strategic Organizing. It's a six-month program. It's an intensive program. You have to already be an organizer to join this program. It's sort of a graduate school mm -hmm. for troublemakers. You know, if, uh, <laughs> if, if you haven't caused any trouble, we're not going to teach you how. It's if you've already been causing trouble, we're going to teach you how to be more effective. You get the difference. I have a couple of candidates out there then. Okay, good. And so if you've been involved in a Chicano Studies program or a Black Studies program or a Women's Studies program, if you've done environmental organizing, if you, you know, actually, because it's going to take you out on the bus for four hours a day, you'll have classes on problems of the empire, including Women's Studies, Chicano Studies, Black Studies, Women's Studies, I said that. You're going to have, I'm going to teach a class called um, the Organizers Exchange, which really, as you go out on the bus, I will try to give you advice on um, why it's so hard to try to change minds. We need people who speak Spanish and Korean. The bus riders are pr primarily Latino and Asian and also black. And Mark Anthony Johnson is a graduate of our program. He's in his um, second full semester at the National School for Strategic Organizing. So I'd like to thank you for inviting us. It's just beginning to scratch the surface and turn it over to my colleague and I'd be very happy to take your questions afterwards. Yeah. Before I go right, yeah, please. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Evol, the, let me ask you a couple of questions. So do you have to apply for the school? Is yes. there an application process? And then you, is there tuition or do you give them a stipend or how do they live during those six months? Because they're already getting a lot of student loans and stuff like that. Right. So, how does um, that work? The, the program is very competitive. Uh, it, you, there's an application process on our website, www.thestrategycenter.org. One person here is already aware of the program and plans to apply. It's a six-month program. You get a stipend. You get housing. Uh, if you live in L.A. and you already have housing, that's fine. But we actually would rather get you housing right near the because we're in the kind of uh, Koreatown, Pico Union area, and it's easier to just, since you work very late, especially for women, you'll have an apartment with another colleague. You get a bus pass. Um, you get medical w in terms of a progressive, I, I don't know anybody else in the, the world who does that, but after one month in the program, you get full medical coverage. Uh, we, you need to fill the application out. The, the deadline is April 30th. We like college graduates. I mean, that's a particular, you know, unless you're going to take a year off. But it's a six-month program that often, if you do very well, we offer an extended six months afterwards. So we, and, and is everything in this brochure? And most yeah. of it is, but you can come over and talk to Mark, <laughs> Anthony, and I between the brochure and that. Uh, we've now graduated 75 people from the program. Most of them are still out in the movement. So uh, which one has caused the most trouble, and what trouble did he cause? Or she caused. Well, I'd say Kikanza Ramsey, our first uh, graduate, who's now 35 with two children. Um, she was in on the very founding of the Strategy Center. She went down to Wilmington and organized low. She's a black woman who speaks fluent Spanish. She went down to Wilmington and uh, organized low-income communities there against Texaco. She then became one of the lead defendants and lead organizers in the Bus Riders Union. She stayed with us for 10 years. She submitted, uh, she learned how to submit uh, declarations to the court, and now she's not now on our board of directors. So she stayed with us for 15 years, and she's still active. Hmm, good. So again, if any of you are interested, you got the website. There's also a brochure over here, and you know, especially after class, we can uh, s uh, stick around and talk to uh, Mr. Eric Mann. Um, let's t go to uh, Dr. Aval. He's a professor at USC. Department of Preventive Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine. 
uh, here at, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Oval. Thank you. Well, Eric talked to you about the uh, political uh, and activist side of environmental justice. I was asked to come and talk to you about health and the disparities that are associated with uh, environmental justice issues. So what I want to do is tell you a little bit about the kind of work we've done. Mostly I do environmental health research. I'm interested in the, the relationship between exposure and disease and understanding how environmental exposure can lead to disease and lead to respiratory health problems. I'm particularly interested in children's respiratory health. Um, we've done a lot of studies with thousands of children, uh, primarily public school children across Southern California, sort of from San Luis Obispo to San Diego, looking at uh, how their lungs and respiratory systems, how their symptoms, how their uh, life activities affect their respiratory health development. We would like, I'm in the Department of Preventive Medicine, and you may ask why preventive medicine is even interested in something like this. And of course, if you grow up healthy, you tend to have less health problems, and so it feeds in on itself. And, and in looking at these thousands of children growing and trying to understand how air pollution in particular affects their health, we found a number of troubling things. And so the, the results I want to share with you have to do with current levels of exposure. So keep in mind we're, talking, we're not talking about exposures the way they used to be, these pictures you might have seen. We're talking about current day exposures. What we've seen by following uh, ch several thousand children, picking them up, enrolling them in, in, in these studies as fourth graders, as nine and 10 year olds, and following them through high school. So looking at them through those 10 years of growth, um, as, they, uh, as, the, as their lungs grow, because your lungs grow pretty much until you're in your late teens, early 20s. And so we're catching sort of that, that critical period of growth and tissue systems are very sensitive when they are growing and uh, can be affected by external stimuli. What we found is that children that are growing up in more polluted areas have slower growing lungs. And it's only a little bit each year, it's perhaps a percent and a half difference between growing up in, in dirty areas or cleaner areas in terms of air pollution. But by the time you look at where they are several years out, it actually makes a big difference. And by the time you look at them at age 18, there are almost five times the rates of clinically significantly low lung function in otherwise healthy young adults now in dirty areas as there are in clean areas. And, th and this is actually clinically significant in the sense of if you came to a doctor's office and we did lung function tests and actually could measure substantial differences in your function. The reason why we're interested in that is low lung function is a predictor of mortality later in life. If you have low lung function, you tend to have higher respiratory problems, more symptoms, and sort of thinking about it as a growth curve, if you're lower on the curve, you tend to be the first ones to sort of drop off on the other end. And so sort of the name of the game, sort of in the game of life, is to get up as high on the curve as you can and stay up as high as you can for as long as you can. And so we want all these kids to get as healthy a start as they can, to stay up as high on that respiratory health curve as they can for as long as they can. And if you grow up in an area that has higher pollution, you don't do that. You tend to have lower lung function, more respiratory problems. If you have asthma, you tend to have more symptoms, more bronchitis, more wheeze. If you don't have asthma but exercise in areas that are high in certain kinds of pollution, you are more at risk for developing asthma. So there actually is some suggestion that there's a causal link between air pollution and asthma. And there's just a whole range of specific pollutants that are associated with specific health outcomes. So we're concerned about the health of children as they grow. I sit on a couple of committees that are active here in Los Angeles, one that has to do with the understanding what the alternatives are and what the issues are in the ex potential expansion of the 710 freeway system, which is, a, which is an old freeway that runs from the ports of Los Angeles and uh, Long Beach up to the Commerce and Downtown Rail Yards. And primarily is used by lots of heavy vehicle, large diesel trucks that move cargo from the Port of Los Angeles to the train yards and out east to the distribution center. You may or may not know that almost 40% of the cargo that comes into these ports, and these ports are the third, together are the third largest port in the world, and by far the largest port in this country. These ports handle a lot of goods that move through this country, and yet over 40% of what comes through this port just moves, only, uh, just moves on through here. It doesn't stay here in Los Angeles. It doesn't stay here in California. We just provide services for the rest of the country. It just moves through. So we're really just a conduit for what moves through. And yet we bear the economic, the we get some of the economic 
blessing in the sense of jobs, but we also bear the economic burden and the environmental burden of having to deal with what the infrastructure means for moving all these goods through the area. One of the implications for moving these goods is we have all these trucks on the freeway and we have a lot of diesel emissions because all these trucks by and large are, the big trucks are diesel trucks. And so we have an issue of exposure. And that's one of the things that gets me involved into the uh, project. We're interested in exposure. It turns out that being close to a source of exposure, you have very high, potentially very high exposure close to the source. And if you look at, at uh, engine combustion, and we won't get into the mechanics of it right now, but if you look at engine combustion and issues associated with uh, operation of diesel engines, operation of diesel locomotives, operation of the ships coming into the harbor, which are primarily bunker fuel and, and, and relatively dirty fuel in the sense of air quality and contaminants in the fuel. What you see is that we have both a regional problem, that is the pollution that comes out of all these engines are small enough and of, of particular kinds of pollutants that stay aloft and in the air for many days so they spread out over the whole region. And then the other issue is that some of the, the particles and so forth that come from diesel trucks, from ships, from locomotives, very close to the source you get the very highest concentrations. So within the first hundred meters or so of the roadway, the closest hundred meters to a freeway, for example, the closest hundred meters to a locomotive, to a train line, you get the very highest exposure in terms of very small particles. And we're becoming increasingly concerned in, in health research in terms of very small particles because very small particles are turning up in the most peculiar places. They're turning up in cells in your body where they shouldn't be. They're turning up in brain tissue and heart tissue. In areas, apparently, these, these particles are small enough to transcend the air tissue interface and get into and disrupt the normal activities of your body and of your cells. And this is a problem for both your health and scientifically and mechanically for understanding how to, how to go about reducing exposure in public health strategies. The reason why I digress and talk about these exposures is if you think about now where do people live and what kinds of communities live close to freeways, close to rail lines, where do those rail lines go, where do those freeways go, you don't see very many freeways through Beverly Hills, through Palos Verdes. You don't see the ports right in these sorts of more affluent neighborhood backyards. Where you see these neighborhoods, where you see these freeways, where you see these, these train roadways primarily is through areas of lower SES conditions, lower socioeconomic conditions. And it may be a chicken and egg thing. It may be, as Eric said, that it's less expensive. The housing is less expensive. You can afford to live there, so you do. It may be that they, the development of these areas, the expansion of these areas, move into areas that don't have the political voice. Sure. That they can actually get the property to develop those lands. So you find, tend to find train yards, distribution centers, warehouses, trucking yards in areas that really don't have the political voice to say, we don't want this here. And so what we have is sort of an unsettling pattern of where exposure is and what the implications of those exposure are. So we have a, a situation where we have children growing up very near train yards. We have children growing up very near high, uh, high occupancy, high uh, usage freeways. And some of our freeways, uh, in terms of vehicles, have almost half a million vehicles a day pass on the roads. So we're talking about a lot of volume of, of, of activity here. And I'm not just talking, although I've, I've mentioned prior to now diesel emissions, I'm not just talking about diesel because we're, it's, a, it's a similar issue with gas combustion engines as well. You get a lot of small particle exposure from gas engines. The reason why we're more concerned with diesel is there's been a lot more emphasis, a lot more care, a lot more concern about <coughs> automobiles because more of us have them, more of us use them. And so the controls are on, primarily the controls come first on cars. And then sometime later, we get to cleaning up trucks. So trucks are several years behind. The big trucks are several years behind in terms of air quality controls and reducing emissions from them. Trains are even further behind in terms of getting those clean up, those reductions, those improved engines, those reduced emissions on them. And ships are even further behind in getting those. And yet, in terms of exposure, it runs in exactly the reverse way. The ships that are in our, our uh, ports at the port in San Pedro Bay in Los Angeles and San Pedro emit a tremendous amount of pollution. The port alone, if you look at the port as one point source, the port alone accounts for almost a quarter of the air pollution in terms of particles and NOx, that uh, oxides of nitrogen, across our basin each day. And so just that one area accounts for almost a quarter of what's in the air each day. 
and that's just from ships. Just well, does from that ships, also include the the trucks and everything else around it? If that? you look at it completely, it's from the trucks and everything else around it. But the ships are roughly ninety percent of the of the emission source, and so really. Everything else is small potatoes. We, I just want to remind the students that we had uh, Councilwoman Janice Hahn here, and she talked about uh, uh, about a new um, system that they were setting up over there that when ships came in, they used to idle and have the uh, emissions come out, but now that they have to, they have to plug in. Right. And that they're going to convert that. They're nowhere near. They just started the process. But and very few. Drive, that's the AMP program on the Port of Los Angeles, the, alter, the alternative marine program. And it's a way, it actually is a clever way because of the, most of the emissions when a ship is in, is, it, this is called hoteling, most of the ship uh, emissions have to do with when they're sitting there keeping the electricity on board, which is a relatively small portion of the engine operation, but keeping things refrigerated if they have things that need to be kept cold and operating while they're there. And they may be there for a couple of days while they unload. And so while they're just sitting there, burning uh, dirty fuel at our port, it's emitting right in the immediate area, which in the case of the Port of Los Angeles is Wilmington and San Pedro. In the case of Long Beach, the Port of Long Beach is, is Long Beach and the immediate community is downwind of so, there. So this program that uh, Councilwoman Hahn talked about, is that real or is that just? Well, the program is real. There are a few ships that are outfitted for it, but if you, you need to take into account, think about how fast you go out and buy a new car and replace it with a cleaner new car. And each, each new model year is much cleaner than the previous year, so replacing a new car is cleaner. Oh, so they're not People don't just go out and buy a new boat, a new ship. So they have to buy a new ship. They, they can't convert existing ships to use the electricity. No, they can convert the ships, but it's a major rewiring problem to rewire a ship so that you can just plug it in. Yeah. They're not normally configured that way. And so it's not a trivial operation. And in that sense, it's not a, a widely used uh, current process. It's something that's coming in future ships mm -hmm. now that are, that are coming. But there's a lot of a lot of the the world fleet is not configured to plug in. Mm -hmm. We hope that'll work, but it's, currently it's not that's not the case. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. I just want to remind the students about the previous speaker. So, so we have issues of exposure, which lead to to issues of health, and because of where people are situated, where they live. I mean, if you think about how the communities are laid out, for example. Even school districts often buy up land. Parks are developed alongside freeways, alongside road is because they're, they're sort of used as buffer areas because they're inexpensive. The land is cheaper there. It's inexpensive. You can buy it. So if you think about it in terms of exposure, where do you not want to send kids to go exercise? Because when you exercise, you go to higher rates of ventilation, you breathe more air, you take in more pollution. Where do you not want to send them? You don't want to send them right alongside the roadway. Where do you put the parks? Where do you put the school playgrounds? Take a look at the map one time and look and see where the schools are. And by and large, there are a troubling number of schools right alongside freeways, right alongside some of these areas. Parks are right alongside these areas. And so we have sort of a, a, a disconnect between what we know about exposure and health and where we put the opportunities for exercise and, and uh, health. And exercise is a good thing. I'd encourage everybody to go out and exercise. You just have to sort of pick the place and time where. So I guess uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with saying that we know a lot. We still need to learn a lot more. We understand a lot now about <coughs> exposure, about health. Um, are these effects permanent? Well, with the exception of death, uh, <laughs> all other things, I guess, are negotiable. What we're finding, we've done studies to look at kids that have moved away, that have grown up in dirtier, clean air areas, higher or lower pollution areas, and moved away to different kinds of areas. So if you live in a clean area and then move away to a dirty area, what happens to your lungs through your teen years? And we looked at the same, the same question in a group of kids that moved from dirty to clean and clean to dirty and looked at what happened. And surprisingly enough, what we found was is if a child moves during their teen years from areas of dirter, dirtier air to cleaner air, their lung function growth rates start to accelerate. Their lungs, in essence, much like smoking, if you stop smoking, your lung start to repair. They never fully repair. You don't catch up again in that sense. But you go back on that slope of growth. You improve. And for the kids that move from a clean to dirtier area, their lung growth rates slow down. They decelerated to behave more like the peers living in the dirty area. So what that says to us are two things. First, it says that your lungs are truly a dynamic system, that if you, do, if you affect some change during that growth period, you can actually make a measurable change. But the other thing that says in a bigger sense in terms of living and, and breathing the air in Los Angeles is making a change in the quality of the air now makes a measurable change in the health of our communities and our children. Because if you clean up the air here, if you do it now, 
while you're growing, for this generation, for the next generation, you can actually affect the growth rate, the respiratory health, and the public health implications of the population growing up in these areas now. So we think that's a hopeful message, but it, means, it says that we need to be active, we need to do something about cleaning up the air, because doing something now makes a difference. And every year we wait, every year we look and say, you know, the air's getting cleaner, but maybe next year we'll get to clean air here in Los Angeles. There are thousands and thousands, in fact millions, of kids that are growing up with respiratory problems because of it. So have we seen the impact of those of us who grew up in LA in the 60s and 70s before? Any, when, when, I, I think pollution, air quality was much worse back then. Air quality was much worse back there. I grew up here. Uh, air so quality. What, are our, what about our lungs? What are, how are they? Air quality uh, was much worse in the 60s and 70s here. And in fact, it is true that there's been a dramatic improvement in air quality in Los Angeles let alone the fact that there's been a tremendous increase in number of vehicle miles driven, number of cars in the basin, the population here, we still see the number of air quality, the number of days in which the air quality levels are violated, that the air quality standards are exceeded here, going down. The air is getting cleaner here. But the other thing we're learning is that it's not clean enough. At the current levels, we're still seeing health effects. What it means for us that grew up here I don't know. I mean, I have to assume that we do have some respiratory problems, some respiratory disease associated with growing up here. Uh, in, in a sense, our time is, you know, is, is sort of done because your lungs are Thank, growing. Thanks for that. <laughs> your lungs are growing uh, only to your late uh, teens, early 20s. Uh, now you need to do other things to sort of keep yourself healthy and keep moving. So let me ask you a very couple of specific questions. What would you recommend to the two candidates running for mayor to improve uh, public health and air quality. Do you have specific rec recommendations that you would make to them that, that kind of two things, some that are, you think are practical and doable right away and then others that are more long term that they just begin to initiate but would have long term impacts? I sit on the mayor's task force to look at the port uh, to try and figure out how to reduce emissions in the port from the health perspective to try and give them some guidance. I think it's, you know, it's hard to say whether that was a, a political statement on the part of the mayor to do this or whether that was really a heartfelt Does decision. it matter as long as the results doesn't are? doesn't matter so long as something gets going. And I think it's great that something is going and something underway. It's an, it's an incredibly difficult problem to sort of turn the, uh, the clock back, if you will, turn the emissions back on the port. But I think it's something we have to do. So in, something, in terms of something we can do in the, next, in the now and the near future, I think we really need to press ahead with emission reduction strategies on all areas in cleaning up the port emissions, in getting lower sulfur fuels into the ships, in getting diesel trucks with newer, newer, cleaner engines. But, but okay, the first part about the ports is a lot more, in con more a lot more control for the mayor and the city. But the, the trucks, though, that's outside the control of cities. Is it or is it not? Well, it's outside the control of the cities. The trucks are, are a mobile, uh, movable, emission source, a mobile source. Mobile sources are controlled by the state of California, by the Air Resources yeah. Board. The Air Resources Board is entrusted on the state level with safeguarding the public health and air quality. And so in that sense, the mayor, and, and, and in terms of strategy, the mayor can work with the state of California, the Air Resources Board, to enforce increased regulations on the diesel trucks. So is there anything that the mayor could do by executive order that would help with our air quality tomorrow? Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know what the, the powers of the mayor are. I mean, I, I think of things in terms of sources. Uh, stationary sources are controlled by the local regulatory agency. They can do something. That's a multi-county agency. Mobile sources are controlled by the state. They can do something. The mayor brought together all these people and said, we need to do something. The mayor, the Port of Los Angeles, the, port, the airport, and the seaport are both departments of the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the mayor controls them. So things that he says has to be done directs to be done, can be done in that area. There are lots of operations within those two areas that need to be. If the, if the port were to say, you can only make a, uh, any vessel can only make a call here at the Port of Los Angeles if it is a clean engine, if it uses low sulfur clean fuel, that's something that the port can decide to do yeah. and deal with it. So, Eric, what would you recommend to the uh, two candidates in terms of uh, what they could do? Well, I think the first thing, if I can just take a step sure. back quick, is that one of the problems that we have to understand if you really study this thing is that what's happened in the last 50 years in terms of the technology of society is unsustainable. 
So we have right now 8 million cars on the road in L.A. We have... Our uh, L.A. County or L.A. LA City? County. Uh, 10, 10 million people, 8 million 10 cars. 10 million people and 8 million cars. GM, let's just take another fact. GM is having a lot of problems with its sales right now. So they've decided to put almost all their models into big SUVs and these giant, giant pickups now where you see one person driving like a, a, a monstrous truck. Now, um, I've been at the UN, going to the UN a lot and going to the, uh, talking to people in the, in the uh, small island states that are uh, having their islands virtually inundated with flooding because of global warming. That's a product of a lot of the emissions, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions coming out of the United States. So we're looking at a situation where as individual consumers, we're not really that interested in a revolutionary alternative, but as a society, we're gonna have to be. So here's the concrete. Um, we have a proposal in front of the MTA for 650 buses that the mayor, who has four votes on the MTA, doesn't automatically pass. Four out of 13. Four out of 13 could get that billion dollars passed. That's the particular thing we're asking both candidates, to take a billion dollars and prioritize buses that would take people to schools, hospitals, and so forth. The second thing we're trying to do is what's called bus-only lanes on major thoroughfares, so that if you noticed on the, if you ever rode a bus, it's stuck in traffic, right? And the cars are more mobile than the buses. But we have, on Wilshire now, a one-mile strip of a bus-only lane that goes faster than the cars do. If we could have, and Antonio's been interested in this one, if we could get like Central Avenue and uh, Western Avenue and Wilshire and uh, 3rd and, and 8th and Slauson, where the buses are shooting rapid buses going down faster than the cars, a lot of people would get out of their cars. The third thing we're proposing, which is very radical but doable, is bus only, is, is car free sections of the city and auto free days. Um, we had one of us. Hey, this is LA. Nobody's going to do that. Well, they're going to have to. How choose. many of you would be for a car free days when you could not drive your car on that day? You don't have a car, you don't count. <laughs> All right, if we no, told kidding. you, seriously, in, in the city of Bogota, listen. In Mexico City, too? In, yes, in, in the city of Bogota, they passed a car-free day one, just to start once a year to see what would happen. And it would pass like 60%, 70%. And everybody either rides a bike, walks, or uh, uses public transportation. And now they've passed something that by the year 2015, you can't use your car between 3 and 6 in the evening and between 6 and 9 in the morning. So no rush hour uses of cars. So there's an example where the people of Bogota, because of all the things that you pointed out, because of reduced low lung function, because of asthma and cancer and emphysema, are willing to make radical changes in their lives. You think there's the political will for that number? I think, we, I think the first That's two are possible. The, the I don't know about the third one. The Riders Union is here to try to change people's, people's minds to get five of you to get involved with us to change the other 95 people's yeah. minds. Let me have a question from back there. I just wondered, are you, do you guys think they should have a bus stop? Because I know that I don't know where a bus stop is near my house, so I don't have to drive to a bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's, a, she's the same one that drives to work out. Right. So it's like. Um, <laughs> yes, the, the theory of our new service plan. In order, in order for public transportation to work, it has to begin with what we call capillary bus, buses that begin very close to your house. The experience has been that if you can't get a bus within three or four blocks of your house, you won't right. take it. No. So the first thing is it could be a great bus on, on, let's say, Central Avenue. But if you have to walk six blocks and then come back at the end of the night in the dark, you're, you're, gonna, t you're gonna go get a car. So we're working on jitneys and shuttles Right. We even have ideas for teenagers getting paid at the bus stop with, you know, MTA stuff to walk people home late at night. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we have a plan for more bus stops. More bus stops. Yeah, let, get you, yeah go ahead. Um, nice and loud. Oh, you mentioned earlier that <laughs> Too early.
Asian and black, I think you mentioned. Yes. So a lot of it has to do with race. So how are you going to get people that are more affluent or white people that are not represented that currently ride the buses to ride the buses and get out of their cars? So but give them some data. There's currently about 500,000 people a day who ride the bus. That's half a million people a day ride the bus, correct? That's correct. And there's about a million boardings, meaning that's they ride right. the bu bus 1. twice. 1.3. Oh, 1. So board. that's even higher. Okay. That's right. 1.3 million boardings. Of those half a million, how many, what percent roughly are Latino, black, okay, Asian? On, of those half million, 50% are, are Latino, higher still than the percentage in the population. 22% are black, which is double the population in LA County. About 11% are Asian Pacific Islander, which is about even with their percentage in the, in the population, although they may be growing to 13, 14. And the numbers don't exactly add up, but it's the last number is 19% right, white. Now, 19% white is, is the question. I think what I'm trying to say to you is that we have two problems here, don't we? One, we have a cultural problem, which is some white people don't want to be on a bus that's predominantly black, Latino, and Asian, whether it's a nice bus or an old bus or a diesel <coughs> bus or a clean bus. So some of the cultural change that has to take place is on race relations. The second has to do with class relations because a lot of the people on the bus are poor and you have somebody with a boom box and you have somebody snoring from having worked at a sweatshop all day. And you know, if, if you go out on the Metrolink, they'll give you two seats plus one for your laptop. So it's clearly geared, that $10 subsidy is geared to encourage your class privilege. Can we get, it's sort of like the abolition movement, can we get white people to make a commitment to the city, to make a commitment to a predominantly of color city? That's a political question. The Bus Riders Union is working very hard because we have a lot of great white members, but they're in the minority. And I think a lot of white people are having trouble being in the cultural minority. Mm -hmm. and, and that's part of the problem, not just a geographic or scientific problem. I'm not sure that the necessarily the goal is to get white people on the buses. <laughs> I'm, I, I mean, if you look at the... the are, are you saying that because you're white or you, these are just... <laughs> I, I, you know, no, but I, my point is that if you look at the demographics of California and the demographics of Los Angeles, the plurality and the pretty soon the majority of the people here will not be white. And I think if you turn, in terms of looking at public health and overall moving people in terms of effectively moving in the economy and moving people through, the idea to great access to transportation and how to more effectively move product, move people through the communities without <coughs> impacting their health and the communities. And so I think it's a larger question than, than color. I think it's more a question of effective transportation well, I think one of the questions I'm trying to ask everybody here is if, if we reach a public health crisis, right? I mean, it, like for instance, right now most of us don't have severe lung disease. But when I went down to Wilmington mm -hmm. and I organized low-income communities in Wilmington, a lot of that is in, in this book, you Always Leave No Air, um, we went to these families, these predominantly Mekano families, and we said, do you have any health problems? No, nope. no, everything's good. Uh, is vomiting a health problem? Yeah. How about the dizziness? Yeah. Nausea? Yeah. Well, do any of your kids have asthma? Oh, yeah. Well, three of my four daughters have asthma. And sometimes the smell is so bad that it wakes me up at five in the morning, you know. But it was funny how working class people are so proud, you know, do you have any health problems? No, I have no pro health problems until we ask them any specific questions. Now the question is, can they be the priority? Because our demands there were for Texaco to slow down their production until they could reduce emissions. Right, and of course nationally, because of the gas shortage That's and right. all that, we're asking them to increase their production. That's right. So huh. nationally, because of the massive energy gut, glut, Saudi Arabia is asked to be in going into its, re, um, what do you call it, its reserves. <coughs> Bush is talking about the Alaskan reserves. Um, the gas guzzlers of all of us who are driving cars that want more gas are saying really the hell with the kids in Wilmington. So that's going to be the social fight we're going to have to have. Dr. Abal, wh what's the definition of public health? 
we keep hearing that term. What does that mean? Well, I think it probably, I mean, I think you might challenge everybody to ask what they think public health means. Uh, in my case, I think public health has to do with both the, the mental and physical health of the population. And on the physical side, that, you know, everybody has uh, a right, not just a, an opportunity, but a right to clean air, <coughs> to clean water, to uh, the opportunity to grow in a healthy mode and achieve sort of their, their maximal potential in terms of uh, physical stature, health, free of symptoms. And, but is a dimension of public health, I mean, I think most of us, for the majority of our health, it is what we do, our actions, whether we smoke or not. But I thought also part of public health is that no matter what, you live in LA, you're not gonna be able to escape. There are certain pockets where you escape air quality problems, but that it's, it's present there and that, every, that it takes public entity intervention to help solve this problem. That's not a problem that you yourself or your family can solve. It's, well, I think it's a that, collective health problem. I think that's true, but I think that's, that's also a potential way for everyone to get a uh, sort of a cop out in the yeah. sense of you need to buy in, you need to be engaged and invested in the community's health. You can't just say, well, I can decide for myself to smoke or drink or you know, take drugs or do whatever. But in terms of the, it being smoggy outside today, that's sort of beyond what I can do, so I'm just not gonna deal with it. Get on my but you know, head. you choosing to uh, drive to the, the, you know, two blocks to the to the theater. You choosing to have uh, to run the house with uh, have a fireplace when it's not needed. Or use you know burn burn uh, uh, wood in the fireplace when it's not necessarily needed, or drive a big SUV when you there are, are other alternatives. Those are all choices you make. Mm -hmm. uh, get Chris and then Juanita, and then we'll go over here to. I mean, is he, is he right about convenience? Is LA is just inconvenient to ride it? Or are we just making that up that, you know, no. you, when you, I find a lot of people when they go uh, on, a, on a trip or vacation that they walk a lot more. And I would say to them, well, why don't you walk like that when you're in LA? Oh, just not what I do. Well, <laughs> yeah, you have to understand that when we began the bus riders union, just hang in there, everybody, please. Um, when we began the Bus Riders Union, the Los Angeles MTA was in the process of dismantling the bus system to build the rail system. It was literally stealing money from the bus system. There were 2,000 buses. Of the 2,000 buses, 1,000 of them, all of them were diesel, all of them were diesel, and 1,000 of them had between 500,000 miles and a million miles on them, which meant they didn't even run. You'd get on a bus and they would break down and you'd be stuck in the middle of a, you know, of a bus ride. Over five years of suing the MTA and, and slow but steady progress, they've gotten rid of all those old buses and we now have 2,300 brand new buses. That's the really good part. If you're going down from like UCLA to downtown, um, let's say in our office on Western and Wilshire and you got the, uh, what, what's the bus line, Mark, Mark Anthony? Or? 720, you could have a great ride. I mean, that would be, you'd be impressed by that rapid bus getting you from UCLA right down Wilshire to our office. <coughs> but what we have in front of the federal courts right now is a proposal for another 700 buses because we need, like, a lot of the buses don't run at night right now. They don't run on Saturday. They don't go, they, they, they're not that good. So the reality of the bus system right now in LA is if you were not socially conscious, I'd say take a car. Because most of the people who ride the bus are what we call transit dependent. Mm -hmm. They ride the bus because they got no choice. We've improved it a lot, but sometimes still there's a 40 minute wait for a bus. So we're trying to push the MTA to say, if we're gonna attract somebody like you who's what's called a choice rider, right? 
we got to get 24-7 service. we got to have buses coming every eight minutes. We have to have the bus that comes closer to your house. We need a couple of billion dollar investments in the bus. Now, here's something crazy. Do you want to take a subway from Western to Fairfax on Wilshire in your life? On Wilshire Boulevard from Western to Fairfax. How many people really need that in their life? It's a trick question. It's not a trick question. It's just... I'd like to take it from here to... All right. To go from Western to Fairfax is going to take $350 billion million. Million dollars a mile to just tunnel. So if that's what, maybe four miles? Less than that. Three? Yeah. So there's a billion dollars just to do the tunnel. For a billion dollars, we could buy 3,000 new buses in L.A. and double the bus fleet from 3,000 to 6,000. That could answer a lot of your questions, but we can't get the MTA board to do that, and that's what we're working with both Han and Villanagosa to see if we can get that commitment. But I think, get, I think... Go ahead. Go, I'm just going to tell the students what I'm going to call Juanita here and then right back there. Okay? Go ahead. I'm sorry. But I think getting back to Dr. Juanita. Garrett's question and your comment, I mean, I think it's an urban policy issue of sorts. The buses and the, and the, the light rail system doesn't go where you want it to go. I mean, I, I take the metro sometimes to go from, I live here at the beach, and to go into the medical center by County USC. And to do that, I have to get to the end of the green line, and then from the green line, take the green line to the blue line, make the transfer, take the blue line to the red line, make the transfer, take the red line to Union <coughs> Station. At Union Station, wait for a school shuttle to get the shuttle from the school, from the Union Station to the university. So I can do that. It takes, on a good day, it takes an hour and a half to an hour and 40 minutes. And had you driven If I drive it, I could drive it in 40 minutes. So, hmm. Juanita. Uh, my question is, seeing how many accommodations have to be taken into consideration to even get, like, the plans of increasing the bus circulation in L.A. started, is, that e is it going to be worth it when we're not too sure that Angelinos are going to take the bus at the end of the day if, if they have access to it? Um, the second part of my question is, who's going to bear the burden of the billions of dollars that it's going to take to um, get more buses out on the street and to make the connections, to make it more convenient, and all those things? Well, the, the first thing is I think you'll be really surprised about, you know, we live, let, let's be honest, we live in a class-divided society, right? We live in a, in, a, in, a, in a society with a lot of rich people in L.A., a lot of affluent people in L.A., and a lot of very poor people in L.A. For anybody who cannot afford, in a family of six or seven or eight, who cannot afford two or three cars, you're going to take the bus. You will walk those six blocks. You will walk those six blocks at midnight if you clean a house or clean, if you go to, to Pacific Palisades to clean somebody's house and that bus takes you back and you're exhausted, you will not have the money to drive to Pacific Palisades. If you're a hotel worker, if you're a garment worker, if you're a, uh, all the service workers in L.A., you are a bus rider. So for them, the expansion of service is a gift because they're going to use it anyway, whether they wait on the street for 40 minutes or they wait on the street for eight minutes. What we have found is every time we increase service and reduce the fare, we get about a 5% increase in ridership because a lot of the most marginal working class families they have a car. And, you know, there's an old joke. Uh, in New York, you know, they would say, everybody's an actor, you know, in New York and California. So they say to this guy, uh, why don't you buy a six-pack? It's much cheaper than buying one Coke. He says, because my agent might call me tomorrow and I'll get a part in Hollywood, right? So when you go on the bus, you go to a lot of working-class people. Are you a bus rider? No, 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 man. I'm a car driver. So why are you on the bus? My bus, my car's in the shop. How long has it been in the shop? A year. Okay. You're a bus rider, brother. I don't know how to break it to you, you know what I mean? But they, wanna, they want the illusion that this is a temporary experience. Uh, we think that we could increase 200,000 to 300,000 bus riders by better service and lower fares. So why do we have to focus on the, uh, on the uh, upper class? Why can't we just improve bus to the, for the sake That's of improving buses? We don't... Do and we see who wants to come. Yeah. Go ahead, right here.
Don't you sit in traffic when you're in a car too, though? You think you're saying that when you're on a bus, you sit in traffic much longer. Like his point that it took him an hour and from right. Right. So the the red bus, the red rapid. I don't know how many of you've yeah. seen those. And then the lane, the bus lanes. There's two different things, aren't they? I mean the dedicated bus. Yeah. We're working. You know, we fight with the MTA a lot on this one. We're actually trying to reach some agreement. Um, as, as Fernando Guerra just said, there's two different things going on. One is what's called rapid bus. That's been very good because it's expanded the, uh, the length of the stops, like instead of every uh, quarter mile to every mile. So if you're going on a long distance, you don't have all those stops. But even the rapid bus has two problems to it. One, MTA has cut service on those buses, so they're so overcrowded. See, they originally promised to double the number of rapid buses. And instead, what they did is take away local service and take away what's called that intermediary service. So you, it's the same number of buses. So when you get on, like I see on road trips, those rapid buses are so unpleasant and so overcrowded. So that's one. We're forcing them to try to get more buses on rapid bus. But secondly, as you pointed out, designated lanes. Imagine you'd also have what's called s signal synchronization which means that as the bus hits a, hits, a, hits a light, the light will change because of a computer trigger inside the bus. We have that technology right, right. now. Right, we have yeah. the technology right now. So if we had rapid bus combined with more rapid buses so you could get a seat, combined with um, dedicated lanes, we would get you on the bus, and we're working with the MTA to try to get that. Yeah. Go ahead, right back here. Well, there are a lot of alternative fuels that are under consideration. To yeah, try what is biodiesel before we try and re reduce the emissions? There are, there are both gases and particles that con there are contaminants in any kind of fuel. fuel combustion, anytime you burn something, is not 100% efficient. You're going to have some contaminants. And so the issue is to try right. and reduce that number of contaminants if you're, if you're stuck with some kind of combustion type engine. And the, so there have been a lot of things that have been brought along. Biodiesel is one of them. Uh, there are emulsified fuels, which is a, a water based or a water uh, diesel mixture. Uh, biodiesel, it turns out, in, in the case of, we've looked at biodiesel in the port, for example, and in the case of the, of the port and looking at biodiesel for the trucks, it turns out to be not that really effective because you get, you get some small reductions in, uh, in oxides of nitrogen, which is a gas that is associated with the production of the, the smog that you see, but you actually get some, you don't really get much, in fact, you get an increase in particulates. And the particulate problem is particularly bad, no pun intended, here in, in Los Angeles. And that's part of the primary reason why you see that brownish haze in the sky when it's smoggy outside. And you see that brown haze, that's mostly particles. And so biodiesel may not be the answer. But going to this other fuel such as... Uh, but what is biodiesel? Biodiesel is, is, a, um, is a fuel mixture made from uh, corn or ethanol or, you know... Uh, uh, a, a mixture from renewable sources. Yeah, so uh, using some renewable source rather than just oil-based uh, um, petroleum, uh, oil-based pr uh, products. Okay, yeah, right here. To Dr. Laval, um, related to the air quality in Wilmington, for the school's uh, children, would it be beneficial to have filtering um, in their schools? Does it make a difference if the air quality that they're exposed to during their school day is filtered? Yeah, well, that's a good question. If you think about where, you, where people spend their time, there's a couple of interesting insights. First of all, we tend to spend roughly 90% of our time indoors. If you think about all the hours of a day, you spend most of it inside. And, and where, do, where does a child spend most of their time inside? Primarily, it's at home or at school. Nowadays, also in the mall, but <laughs> mostly at, at school or at home. And so we've actually proposed that, for example, with respect to the expansion of the 710 freeway, that if in fact the freeway is expanded, that they look at putting air conditioning systems and air purification systems into the schools that are all along the way, as well as noise insulation too. But I think it, I, the short answer is yes. Typically teachers tend to keep the doors closed and the windows closed in the room because it gets too noisy. And so the, the air quality in, in the school classroom can be an issue in and of itself. So an air conditioning system that but an air conditioning system that actually had a purification system that was effective is what's needed, not just a conventional air conditioning system. 
Are you for the 710 extension? Um, I helped write a report to the MTA saying that, uh, well, let me back up. It's, the, a yes or, it's a yes or no question. No. <laughs> uh, the short answer is, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give him a pass. He's an academic. They, I, guess, can't have <laughs> I guess the short answer is, uh, is no, because I think the primary importance in, in talking with all communities along the 22 communities that are along the 710 freeway, the big issue of importance to them is their quality of life, the air quality and the health of their community, both in their public health, their, their personal health, as well as the economic health of their communities, which they see as being violated by the expansion of the freeway. Yeah. And so before they are willing to discuss having the freeway expanded, what they want to see is a specific concrete plan that puts into place that improves the air quality and the health of their communities. Because I asked that question because I've heard the uh, officials in the city of Alhambra who want the extension desperately, they say that overall regional air quality would uh, improve if you if you do the extension, that it wouldn't have, have cars cut off the freeway, slow down, cause congestion, cause more emissions than if you just had the freeway match. I mean, I don't know, that, that's, I've heard them say that several times. Right, I mean, that's a common uh, comment that, you know, if cars move faster, there's less pollution. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> I grew up in Wilmington and went to school in Wilmington. Hey, well, we asked a question earlier. If anybody from Wilmington, you didn't no, raise your I, hand. I came in late. Everyone's oh, you came in late. Like, let me mark that down. No, no, go. Know, oh, you're not in my class. Oh, okay. Um, I noticed that, all, yeah, all the schools are like right next to where diesel trucks right. go by. I remember breathing in all that stuff um, year after year. I still live in Wilmington. And um, have you worked with like maybe like Benning High School or other elementary schools or uh, just to educate the parents saying like, yeah, you can do something, maybe a Tosco or uh, BP or any other refineries, because I know they're really not powerful people and Wilmington is very low economic. It, you know. it, it's a bigger issue or, than just Wilmington. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about how kids get to school on buses, most buses conventionally are diesel buses. And so the school buses, buses right. school buses. Yeah, but and just so the school buses diesel. are diesel engine powered. And it turns out, if you make measurements, the worst place in terms of emissions is towards the back of the bus. In, and so putting your child on a, on a school bus and sending them off to school sort of guarantees a good ex, uh, an unhealthy exposure in terms of diesel emissions. So one thing we can do, no matter where you live, be it Wilmington or anywhere, is get rid of the diesel-based school buses. Yeah, but going on what, um, go on? what uh, Eric Lamb was saying, just telling the parents, like, yeah, your kids are having asthma because of, you know, just telling them what, what's happening, educating them. Because a lot of people don't have that good health insurance or, you know, uh, the, the job to have good health insurance. And a lot of kids are sick, you know. And I have really bad allergies until, you know, I moved out of Wilmington to Santa Monica. And allergies went away. And I, I moved back to Wilmington. And it's like, allergies come back. And it's just like, you know, having the, the parents involved in having them educated, you know, about the, the uh, health effects. So let me tell you what we did, because I'm really glad you asked that. And I ho I seriously, I hope you get a copy of L.A. Fleet to Air, which goes into this, you know, and has a lot of pictures of people in Wilmington. Let me tell you what happened. We sent three terrific organizers into Wilmington, Kikanza Ramsey, Lisa Duran, and Chris Mathis. We, we, d we developed a book about L.A. Fleet to Air. We went out and did a uh, surveys with families on their health problems. The health problems were absolutely off the chart in terms of the, the questions that you've raised. We started building a movement, and I want to just talk to you about the repressive nature of this society about building a movement, because you're trying to organize the Latino community against, let's say, Texaco. So the first thing that happened is that a lot of the parents wanted to get involved, and were very excited about all the things you just pointed out, you know. But here's the first thing that happened. A lot of the men in the community did not want the women in the community involved in the campaign. So as women would go out and join the movement at night, their husbands and boyfriends would frequently tell them, I don't want you to get involved with the watchdog. I think you're flirting with other men. I don't think you're really interested in this stuff. No, seriously. And a lot of the women were literally re-imprisoned in their homes. So that was one of the problems. The second problem we ran into was that Texaco runs Wilmington like a company town. 
that those refineries, you know, run Wilmington in a way so that, for instance, Banning High School, we had a green group there called the Banning High School Green Group. Great, great, great students. And we had teachers there. And we had a, a, a little teatro. And then there's, there's this public school in Wilmington. I forget what it's called. Uh, you know which one I'm talking about? What? Probably. It's just, it's what? It's a, it's a K through seven or something like, what? Yeah. Freeze Elementary School. Do you know that during the period when they were cutting off schools for, you know, funds for schools, Texaco started giving computers to the schools. And then they wouldn't let us have meetings with the schools because they came and told us, well, Texaco is very good to us. We went to the church. There's a Catholic church down in Wilmington. And we were having access to the Catholic church and we were putting in um, uh, political statements in the uh, church bulletin that was going out every Sunday. And we had support from a very progressive priest who was down there. And within about three months, that closed up because Wilmington found out about it. I'm sorry, Texaco found out about it along with the other refineries and pressured the church not to let us do it. Finally, the Texaco refinery blew up. And it blew up in, I believe, 93. And so we became famous because all the work we had done with the community, you know, well, this is going to happen to you. People are funny. If you tell them there's a 15-year exposure to cancer or a 15-year exposure to this, they're not that interested. But if the refinery blows up right in their face, they're very interested. So... Uh, <laughs> Funny how that works. Funny how that works. <laughs> I'm like that too, you know. I <laughs> mean, immediate response. So we had a meeting. We had a meeting in Wilmington of about 800 people who really wanted to get involved. And we and just bear with me. We made the following demands on, on Texaco, right? An on-site inspector on Texaco's grounds to because there's what's called fugitive emissions from these refineries that need to be checked out a community health clinic for children's asthma and respiratory problems that would be paid for by Texaco, um, a 50% reduction in Texaco's refinery emissions, either by 50% reduction in their production or more clean way of producing so it. So you're, you're, you're the result, reason why we have high ga gas prices, right? Thank you so much. Yeah. And then what happened was that Texaco started going around and hiring Latino and black people to go door to door and tell people for $100, I want you to sign away your rights to sue Texaco. And they got thousands of people to sign. We were in an AQMD meeting once. And Tell them what AQMD is. Of the Air Quality Management District that was very sympathetic to us. And they had a, this, this public meeting to tell people about their health problems, right? And all of a sudden, they had these people with, like, Oakland Raider jackets on, you know, and uh, baseball caps backwards sitting in there. And the woman from the AQMD said, excuse me, would anybody who's an employee of Texaco please stand up? And there were 20 spies from Texaco all trying to dress down for the community to intimidate <laughs> people. To inti and she said, would you please leave? Give her credit. She said, please leave. This is a community meeting, and you're not here with the community's best interest. What's my point? That corporate capital organizers, we have a national school for strategic organizing. Don't think they don't. They organize the church. They organize the school. They organize people to buy off. And people signed away saying, any subsequent health impacts from Texaco, this was a permanent lifetime relief. Well, they're organizing schools called the NBA. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> What's a good one for you, Eric? Right. So you well, listen, no, we're gonna have we're gonna have uh, Eric. No, I want him to do it because I saw him breaking up a couple of SUVs on the way over here. <laughs> so I want to see what he says. Why don't you, you, know. why don't you repeat the question for the rest of the students? Oh, I, I will. Go ahead. You gonna do it? No, go ahead, Eric. You do it. 
The question is, do you think that extreme measures like breaking up people's SUVs set back the environmental movement? Um, I think that extreme measures uh, always have, you know, as I teach tactics, tactics are always about is what you're going to do advance your movement? Uh, militant tactics sometimes advance your movement if it's clear. Like, for instance, I would not go up to a person's SUV and smash their SUV. We plan to put um, leaflets in people's SUV, you know, in the windshield wipers and say, look, we'd really like you to think about the impact of this SUV culturally. We'd like you to think about it, about its effect on people in the third world. Why, th why not trade this thing in? Do you really need it, and do you understand the social impact? But we might, for instance, have a boycott of General Motors and also go in front of the uh, um, dealerships and try to also educate the consumers. We went to the um, auto show and put out a thing, I put out a leaflet, which I'll send you if you get involved. It says, what does it say? You love your kids and you love your planet. No, you love your car but you love your kids and the planet more, or do you? And we ask people to make a choice, because a lot of people just love their car more than their kids. So, <laughs> so we do a lot of psychological work. Bashing somebody's SUV is a bad tactic. It singles out a person. It doesn't give them a chance, you know. Well, how about not a person, but going to a dealership and what happened in uh, West Covina where they burned up a bunch of Hummers or something like that. That's not a Hummer. Uh. Hmm. Well, I think there, okay, seriously, there's a situation where you go to a dealer and you burn a couple of Hummers. What you're trying to do is called, I think it's called cognitive dissonance <laughs> as, as a theory. What you're trying to do is get somebody to say, I am very upset because you purposely did it to get somebody very upset, right? Because your first reaction is, you shouldn't burn up a Hummer. But then, <laughs> you know, especially with a rap artist in it who will come back and get you, you know? So, but it may raise the fact that people would say, I think it's wrong what they did, but nobody was hurt. You, you damaged property, not a person. And then somebody else could say, well, my kid, based on your study, is going to have decreased, you, that one Hummer, is going to cost my kid asthma, later cancer, later emphysema. What are we supposed to do was an act of protest? And it might be a good tactic. See, I'd say that uh, it doesn't do the, the good that you want. I mean, the only good I can see of it is it, because that tends to be sort of a photogenic opportunity, it, it brings that to the forefront. People then hear about it, and maybe some people think about environmental issues that are associated with it. But by the same token, as, as many people think about the environmental issues associated with it, some may also think about what a bunch of idiots, what does this have to do with this? And, you know, this is just th not the right way. So I, I don't think that helps the movement unless, you know, there are ways that you can actually channel that in a positive way. I, I just don't think that's the way to go about it. David? Oh, this, I guess it goes for Eric here. Um, Realistically here, um, when we talk about SUVs and we talk about Hummers and all this, as a culture, realistically, what can we do to get people over these SUVs? Because I, I drive a Volkswagen here. And, you know, I'm looking at, at, at our role models that we have to look at. We're looking at Governor Schwarzenegger talking about being an environmentalist. And, and he's got like 50 Hummers or something like this. It, it, but, you know, four of them are being fitted with hydrogen fuel <laughs> cells, you know? And, and it's like, what can we do to get them over this? Because, you know, uh, I don't higher know. I mean, it just doesn't seem prices. like it's worth it. It's funding terrorism. It's uh, with the gas. I mean, that's the, they get their money from oil. Uh, it's uh, What can we do to, like, get over this? Because, I mean, obviously, you're talking about the severe health effects of this. Realistically, because I think, obviously, it's a pretty bad idea to start going to dealerships and they're burning down Hummers. But I mean, I don't know. It just seems like it's not worth it in the end. You know, it seems like we're shooting ourselves in the foot. What's, well, to, what's to be done? What are your options? What is to be done? Well, the first thing to understand is that I work at, at the Labor Community Strategy Center. And uh, we have like the Bus Riders Union Planning Committee. We meet every Wednesday night, seven members 
and five uh, staff. Our meetings never get out l earlier than 11 o'clock at night. They sometimes go to midnight. Now let me tell you what I think the fundamental problem is. There's mass depression in the country right now about everything. People are fundamentally selfish and depressed. They don't care about racism. They don't care about the environment. They don't care about the war. They don't care about the disabled. They don't give a shit about anything. That's the average American right now. All right? Now, I was very lucky. I came of age when I was your age and walked into the civil rights movement. You know, I walked into joining CORE, Congress of Racial Equality. I was at Columbia University during the student strike. And I saw four or 5,000 students saying, we don't want to do military research on our campus to kill the people in Vietnam. And when the people did the extreme thing, which was took over the uh, building, a lot of the students said, well, you shouldn't take over the building, you know, blah, 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 like that. But then the police came in and beat us up. And all of a sudden, the whole campus supported us against the police. Then Columbia tried to build a gym in Harlem. Well, Harlem and Columbia is in Harlem. And they built this beautiful gym, except it was not open to the community. So the black student union tore down the fence, symbolically, you know, that they had this gym fenced off, and said to the community, come on in, it's a community resource. And out of that, Columbia made certain concessions to the community. And out of that, Columbia, I don't think it dropped to the Institute for Defense Analysis, but this was another factor in how we got out of the war in Vietnam. Where we are right now is trying to recruit the small number of deeply outraged, deeply conscious students. We have students coming to the School for Organizers who have already gone to the third world, who have traveled to the third world, for instance, for some public health you know, uh, major, and have seen the, the two billion people dying in the third world on $2 a day and see the relationship of Pfizer not providing AIDS drugs to South Africa, have seen the, the way that Archer Daniel Midlands is uh, bringing uh, genetically modified foods. They have seen the way that U.S. subsidies are making U.S. products so cheap in India that the person who's growing their crops can't grow it cheaper to sell it to their neighbor because it's cheaper to buy something that was sent all the way from the United States because of the farm subsidies to these so-called mom-and-pop uh, stores that are not mom-and-pop farms. They're really uh, agribusinesses. What we're looking for right now is relatively small numbers of people who want to give their life to the movement. We're not interested in that second round of good kids who someday will be very involved. So we get classes of a Francisca Porchas, who parents are immigrants from Mexico, who went to Arizona State and graduated. She's now in her fourth year at the center. She's gone through the school. She works, you know, 60 hours a week on the bus. She testifies at the MTA. She writes leaflets. She's in, involved in the teatro. Uh, Lisa Adler, a Jewish young woman from Bo uh, New York who taught in the public schools, who speaks fluent Spanish. Sun Young Yang, who grew up in Guam, who speaks Spanish, Philip, uh, Korean, and English. We are attracting, you know, in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, garment workers who really care about these issues. Our monthly membership meetings at the BRU have, you know, 75 to 100 people. Or to get a young man like Mark Anthony Johnson, who's been on the planning committee of the Bus Riders Union, who does spoken word, who does gets out on the bus and talks to people. So we're here to recruit. I mean, the reason I was so pleased about being invited is because for some of you who are looking for maybe more corporate, dead-end lives, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, who have sewer, for a lot of you who are really interested in money and, and harmers and basically are trying to create suicide at an early age, you know, you're not the people I'm mainly talking to. But for those people who have an ethical and moral and spiritual side to themselves, who don't want to be a self-satisfied, self-aggrandizing, 
you know, selfish person whose life will end up being nothing. We're very <laughs> interested in talking to you. Okay? I have a, I have a shorter answer. <laughs> I mean, I think each of us can make a difference. I think you make a choice. Your parents make a choice. Your friends make a choice when you go to buy a vehicle. Economically, the market moves in the direction that you push it. If you go out and buy a big vehicle, which has a high markup, which they make a big profit on, they make more of them because they make money on them. And so what you need to do is change the priorities. You need to tell everybody. You need to act in a way that says very clearly that what's important to you is not the size of the vehicle, but the efficiency, what it uses, the conservation, that it does what you need to do, but it does it in a smaller, more efficient way. And then the, the, the mileage changes in relationship to that if you push in that direction, and the size of the vehicle will change in direction of that. But if you go out and buy the bigger vehicle, the bigger vehicle will always be there for you to buy. Okay, good. We have time for one or two more questions. Yeah, way in the back. I got the second question. You say the first question. No, no, it's good. Um, it's uh, they're, they're interrelated. I just I, uh, I. The first question is how do you get? You were talking about whether they're investing or not, being a bus rider. How do you get people to get over that state of mind, state ownership, and being a bus rider, and even find what's a very diverse market? What's your advice to them? Um, I would say that you know it's very easy to find out what your market is. Um, the first thing is that you have to find out what your market is. Right. Where the bus riders union and this is our fight. Mass transportation is a human right. We want a fifty cent fare and twenty dollar passes. Because mass transportation belongs to the masses. B, 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 R, U, B, 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 R, U, B, 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 R, U. Sindicato de pasajeros, sindicato de pasajeros. Bosse sunge jo hop, bosse sunge jo hop. So we like ourselves, you know what I mean? Like you join the, <laughs> you, you join the civil If you're willing to sing, you like yourself. Right, right? <laughs> so... You get rid of the stigma by joining a movement, you know. Yeah, but you earlier um, even mentioned that there was this one guy who said that, you know, oh, my car's in the shop. Right. Well, how long has your car been in the shop? For a year. Right. So it, it, it is a, a question about for you to identify yourself as a bus rider, especially in L.A., right. you know, where they say, you know, nobody walks in L.A. What they really mean is <coughs> nobody's walking in L.A. Right. I mean, so that, that whole issue is difficult. I, I mean, how do you recruit someone to say you are a bus rider? Well... I guess what I'm trying to say is that I do a lot of reading, right? I do a lot of reading about, and, and I'm, I'm working on a book called Revolutionary Organizing in the Age of Reaction. And one, one chapter I'm working on is what's called internalized depression. I'm reading Franz Fanon, for instance, who talks about how the, col the colonized people came to, to hate themselves and identified more with the oppressor, identified with the French, right? identified with the British. Um, that is never going to stop. It's not like someday that problem will go away. All I can try to say to you is that we have a pretty cool movement, right? We pay a lot of attention. You to got a rap song. We got a rap song. We have a film on us. We have a film on us called Bus Riders Union. We have these yellow t-shirts we come in on. When we come on the bus, the driver often grabs the microphone and says, Hey, everybody, this is the Bus Riders Union. Listen up. These people are fighting for you. You know, we just want a bus pass for these high school kids. Now, their parents are thrilled. Believe me, we just had a press conference in front of the, um, one of the places where the MTA sells bus passes. A mother came out with her kid. She had taken her kid out of school that day with the picture, the dollar, to fill out the whole damn application. And she was said, no application needed anymore. The MTA did it for you. And then she came out and saw the press conference where, no, the Bus Riders Union did it for you. She hugged us and kissed us, and we got great publicity today in the LA Times. Read about it. Not a monstrous story, but a nice story saying that we um, 
you know, we contributed to this change in policy. So it moves in a positive way that way. The second point is we're trying to build a democratic institution where we spend lots of time talking about the best tactics, how do we pass a bill. Um, we're on good terms with Antonio Viragosa, Javier Becerra, decent terms with Maya Han. Uh, Diane Feinstein knows who we are. Um, Barbara Boxer knows who we are. Ted Kennedy knows who we are. I mean, over the, over the years, we're known around the country. When we call up, um, we're going to call up uh, the head of the Judiciary Committee, Arlen Specter. He doesn't probably know us, but we have 10 different people who know him calling ahead of time, telling him, you're going to get a call from the Bus Riders Union, and they're a really serious operation. You should listen to them. We've written this four-page letter about why to <coughs> oppose this bill. So I guess what I'm trying to say is organizing is like brain surgery. It's a major. It's something I've done for 40 years. You make lots of mistakes in it. It's in, you know, doctors don't admit that, but doctors make a lot of mistakes. And I talked to this one doctor, and I said, what is the key to being a good doctor? He says, doing it more and more times than the other guy. It's just the it's number of times. Experience. It's a practice and experience. And as an organizer, it's just as a woman or a man, you know, the more times you're on the bus talking to people, you get more confident how to talk to people, you get more sophisticated in your tactics. But if you're interested, I hope a lot of you come over to the table and talk to Mark Anthony and I, because it's, if I may say, it's been a very attentive and very thoughtful, engaged questions. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a little down on students right now because I'm more used to coming to student groups where the, where the students had that level of engagement and there's been a certain absence of it lately. But I think the questions have been of very high integrity and, and really engage, and it's been a great use of our time. Yeah. Well, that, we just have one more question. It better be a good one. It's the last one. So with that, with that said, yeah, 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 come on. Come on. Okay, all right. Okay, um, well, my question was focusing more on uh, alternative fuel resource that you talked about to Dr. Uh, Dave Um But specifically with hybrid technology, and obviously it's been getting better and better recently, and in, in part because it's trying to come up with alternative methods, but the problem has been trying to match the horsepower and the output that a car can have while still offering it in a hybrid version. But then you have the problem of uh, a lot of limitations, the pricing of hybrid vehicles is just extraordinary and higher than standard gas cars. Um, I think it, it, what can be done, in your opinion, or what type of legislation is needed or with the car companies to kind of find some kind of common ground so maybe more people will find that type of car more appealing in the future and you'll have those SUVs. Well, I can tell you what I think, but again, let me preface it by saying that I do health research. I don't do car engineering or design. Um, in my opinion, I think, what, again, what needs to be done is sort of the, the, the interest on the part of the population, the, the public that buys vehicles has to shift and make it clear that this is what we want. This is what's in demand, and the, the market will move in that direction. And so I think you need to make it clear that what you want are smaller, more efficient vehicles, and, that's, and the market will respond to that. So that's one thing. Uh, the hybrids are more expensive, partially because there's a lot of upfront engineering costs now. And you know, as they get out and become in wider use and, and more of a production type thing, the pr it becomes more competitive as there are more manufacturers making those things. Right now, you know, it's basically Toyota is making it. Ford, uh, 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 GM or Ford bought some of the, the engine technology from them and are now going to market it in some of their vehicles. But still, it, and Honda has, has a vehicle as well, but it's still sort of a basically small market. And they see it as sort of a niche market. And what we have to do is sort of, if, if we're going down that route, we have to make that more than just a niche market. Okay. Eric, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. I mean, I, I think I, we're agreeing on this. I mean, I think that eventually consumer movements, I mean, I was able to help keep the General Motors plant open for 10 years, making Camaros and Chevrolets. Uh, wh when that's what I thought was needed to be done by developing a boycott of General Motors if they ever closed the plant. Corporations are profit-driven institutions. If, if priests and ministers and students and people are picketing them, uh, I remember Reggie Jackson saying he used to drive a real, you know, the baseball player, 
uh, he was driving some big car down the street, and he looked in the mirror, and he said, what I saw in the mirror of the, of the store was a real pretentious jerk, and I realized how stupid. I don't think it was the car. No, that's right, it was him. And he, he felt like driving that Rolls Royce, you know, you, you know, he was a baseball player, he made a lot of money. And the point was that he had an epiphany that he looked stupid. I think these people, look, you go into parking lots right now, and there's an in and an out, and you can't get in. The person coming out, the car is bigger than one lane. Have you seen that? I mean, the number of these trucks trying to come in, you can't even get into a mini mall anymore. So I think that if we, I'm very interested. The Strategy Center is going to be doing a three-year campaign to combine the work that you've done to talk about the public health effects, to talk about global warming, and to talk about cultural overconsumption, because it's not just public health, you know what I mean? Like, I'll tell you a little, I'll just tell you a story. I, I, I grew up in GM, and I love big cars. You know, I was a GM worker on the assembly line, and I drove a Cadillac, uh, a, a late model Cadillac. I thought it was the coolest thing going. I'm a big guy, I like big cars, I love Cadillacs. And I drove a Cadillac STS, which I think is the coolest car I've ever, I just love that car. I went to the World Summit on Sustainable Development, and they said we've got to reduce emissions by 50%. Not 5%, which is what Kyoto said, by 50%. So I said, all right, I've got to double the mileage. And I sold my Cadillac, and I bought um, what did I buy? A, to a Toyota um, Camry. It's no great revolutionary sacrifice. It's a cool car. It's lighter, it's, but it gets twice as much mileage. So I did single-handedly reduce my mileage by 50% because I was influenced by people in the third world saying, hey, you shouldn't be driving cars like that. Now, I still miss that car to tell you about the cultural, <laughs> you know, the, the cultural pull of this to talk real. I love my car. I don't love my Cam Tamry. But what the hell? It's the least I could do, you know? And the second thing is I don't drive it as much. And I watch how many miles. I actually watch how many miles, and, and I take public transportation to my office one day a week. So I'm not a big, you know, I could do a lot more, but at least I'm trying to get my life consistent with my politics, right? So I feel I don't think I could talk to other people about it if I couldn't say, hey, in a better world, I wouldn't mind, I, I don't like Hummus, but in a better world, you know, I might like this car, but it's just not right driving these SUVs, and it's sure not right having single passengers I mean, single passengers driving these cars all over the city. They all say, I need it for the safety of my dog. I have a big <laughs> family. And then they're all alone. They're all alone. They got no kids. So, anyway, let's th thank our two guests tonight. Thank you.